the stuff that, that has to accrue over many months that, that will equal the ability to one day be a champion. It's hard. It's hard to be the last man standing. And to, to see him uh, have the emotion that, that he has, and he's, he's one of many in that locker room, uh, it is painful for all of us. But to your question with Joel, he'll look in the rearview mirror and remember this. He will come out better and smarter and stronger and more um, aware of really what it takes. We've been trusting the process of the 76ers for years now. It's resulted in a lot of busted draft picks and a couple players of Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid's variety that have turned out into those top picks and really proved their value to the 76ers through their years and maybe even a full decade of complete tanking. But what we've been seeing this year is a big threat to the entire past decade plus of the 76ers tanking and going through their process. The 76ers are currently 27 and two at home, the best home record in the entire NBA, but they are nine and 21 on the road, which firmly plants them in the middle of the pack in the Eastern Conference. This is probably the most we've ever talked about a four or five playoff seed in the history of the NBA. But the things that surround the 76ers team are so important and so vital to the future of the NBA that we really should be paying even more attention to it. The analytics that I've found in researching for this video are pretty shocking. And I'm just gonna share a few examples of how the 76ers are impacted depending on which route they go. So let's start off as we do at the Magic video in the numbers. First of all, Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons are the third and fifth highest players paid on this team. Embiid's currently getting 27 million and Ben Simmons is actually on the last year of his rookie deal at 8 million. That means Tobias Harris and Al Horford are at a combined $60 million this year and will be costing them at least 200 million over the next four years. Joel Embiid's getting 27 million, and then we have Josh Richardson for three years at 10 million a pop. And after that, it sharply declines. Even with all that, over the next five years, the 76ers have guaranteed over $630 million, most of which comes from their first four or five players. But when we go into the numbers, Especially when Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons are not on the court at the same time, we get to take a look at why this team is being talked about so much. So Ben Simmons was out for a while with back problems and Joel Embiid has dealt with his injuries as well. So we're going to start with Joel Embiid when he was injured. So during the time where Ben Simmons took over the offense, not only did pace improve significantly, but among all lineups that have played at least 100 minutes for the Philadelphia 76ers, the highest net rating of them actually includes Furkan Korkmaz and James Ennis III, along with Ben Simmons, Al Horford, and Tobias Harris at a net rating of nearly 20. You go to the next best lineup with Joel Embiid, Al Horford, Tobias Harris, Josh Richardson, and Ben Simmons, which is their starting five, drops all the way to 8.5. Their pace also drops by 3%, their assist percentage drops by 14%, and their assist to turnover ratio is nearly 33% better. During the time that Joel Embiid was out with injury, Ben Simmons increases scoring by three points, he increases free throw percentage by four points unbelievably, and was actually able to increase his field goal percentage by 3% as well. So he became more aggressive and he got better shots at the rim. Going back to the overall home record, this Joel Embiid himself is averaging three more points, 7% better from the field and 4% better from the free throw line at home than away. So the amount of statistical anomalies that happen with this Philadelphia 76ers team are unbelievable once you go into the advanced analytics. 
I decided to look at the defensive rating of a bunch of four-man lineups that the 76ers use because their four main players are the players that this team is built around, Ben Simmons, Joel Embiid, Al Horford, and Tobias Harris. So out of all four-man lineups that have played at least 100 minutes for the 76ers, the defensive rating starts at 111.5 with a plus rating of 3.2. As you go down the list, Joel Embiid does not appear until the 11th lineup. That means the 11th best defensive rating among four player combinations for the 76ers, 10 of the first 11 don't include Joel Embiid at all. One of the best defensive centers in the league is not even in the top 10 best lineups for the 76ers defensively. And even past all the numbers, when you look at the eye test, let's take a look at what type of players Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons are. Ben Simmons, he's modeled after Greek Freak. He's long, extremely athletic, very strong, and can finish in traffic. He's not a shooter, he's a facilitator, he's a playmaker, and most of all, he attacks the basket in transition and loves to run with the ball. He cannot shoot. Joel Embiid is a back to the basket center who should honestly be getting more post-ups, but can stretch the floor, can shoot the three, and is honestly uh, almost as dominant as Hakeem Olajuwon when it comes to posting up when he's hot, especially around the paint. When you put two of these play styles together, what ends up creating is a really clogged lane with not many shooters around them, in a system that doesn't fit them with players and a bench that do not support them. Right now, the 76ers bench is another thing that I really want to put some emphasis on. The 76ers have one of the best benches in the past year, so especially the year that they faced Boston in the uh, conference semifinals. They had Ursan Ilyasova, JJ Redick, Mike Scott. They had a lot of good players coming off that bench. But now, the 76ers bench this year is 27th in points per game, 22nd in field goal percentage, 14th a mediocre, 14th in plus minus, and 29th in rebounding. The only person that's really helping them out bench-wise is Furkan Korkmaz and Mike Scott. After that, Matisse Thybul is a great defensive player, but not a great offensive player. Zaire Smith has been injured a little bit, and Glenn Robinson is the next best player coming off that bench. So the 76ers bench easily has contributed to this horrible road record. The next thing is Al Horford. Al Horford was sort of the veteran presence that the 76ers and Elton brand brought in to sort of steady the ship and quell all the things that are still going on with the Philadelphia 76ers. He said to himself in a press conference, out loud and to the public, there are some things going on in our locker room right now that aren't exactly positive. Al Horford has never been one to speak out about anything going on in the locker room. I mean, he spent an entire season in the one of the most dysfunctional Celtics teams that we've seen in recent memory. So when Al Horford comes out and says something like that, you know it's serious. And the fact that Al Horford, on a four-year, $100 million contract, mind you, is only averaging 12 points per game and has been coming off the bench does not help at all with the 76ers situation. He's averaging 12 points per game on 43% field goal percentage and only 32% from beyond the arc. This is the ultimate pitfall with the roster that the 76ers have right now the lack of outside shooting. If they did not, if they would not have Furkan Korkmaz on this team, they would probably be a six or seven seed. His shooting is so desperately needed on this 76ers team that he's popping off for 24 points, 34 points. It's absolutely unbelievable when you only have one shooter, how much pressure and how many shots can be forced upon that shooter. They had J.J. Redick, they had Ursan Ilyasova, they had players 
that could relieve the pressure that Joel Embiid and Ben Simmons bring when they drive the lane. But now they don't have any three-point shooting. Their best three-point shooters are Tobias Harris, who's been streaky, Josh Richardson, who is not a competent, consistent three-point shooter, and then maybe Glenn Robinson or uh, Matisse Thybul. So the 76ers are needing three-point shooting if they have any chance of getting past the first or second round in the playoffs. There are teams like the Indiana Pacers who are sneaking up. The Toronto Raptors are NBA title contenders. The Celtics are back. The Bucks are steamrolling literally everybody through the entire league. The 76ers have to change something. They absolutely have to if they need to get in the playoffs. And the last thing that I want to go over is the person who has been the constant through all the injuries, through the staff changes, through the executive being changed, the injuries and everything, and that is one Brett Brown. Brett Brown, we saw get completely outcoached by Brad Stevens. He has not been able to find a way for Ben Simmons and Joel Embiid to share the court effectively. He has not found a way to utilize Al Horford. Tobias Harris is not providing the scoring that he should be signed for. So at the end of the day, Brett Brown is going to be held responsible for the 76ers failing. He's a good coach, and to be able to get the 76ers to where they are now definitely takes a competent coach uh, to even figure out a system where you can balance those two somewhat well. But if the 76ers want to get past the first couple rounds of the playoffs, if they want to make it to a conference finals and then to the NBA championship, they need to figure something out. Because at this point, we've gone through the process for over 10 years. There have been busted draft picks, players with bad shoulders, bad knees, bad backs, bad ankles, bad coaches. And at the end of the day, the process may have to end in a similar fashion to where it started. Guys, thank you so much for watching. I always appreciate your support. Be sure to subscribe for more NBA videos, and I'll see you next time.